Have you ever heard that something you do is a risk for colon cancer? In this video, we discuss which risks are real and how real they are. One of the most common risks that people are concerned by is their family history. Now, specific genetic conditions are such a high risk that you're practically guaranteed to get colon cancer. In these cases, there is a history across multiple generations of your family of people getting colon cancer at a very young age. But what about when there's a first degree relative, an isolated case within your family? What is the risk of that, a sibling or a parent? Data shows that when a first degree relative had colon cancer at any age, you are likely to have an 80% greater risk of developing colon cancer yourself. We usually cite the average risk of developing colon cancer in a lifetime around 5%, and that would mean that if you had a first degree relative with colon cancer, your risk would be near 9%. What if there is a family history of having colon polyps? Most polyps are very small and they're very common. So if your brother had a few, fear not. However, if someone had a very large polyp, then we're going to recommend that you consider having colonoscopies start earlier and that they be done more frequently. I think that this recommendation is strongest when a polyp was so bad that a person actually had to have a surgical resection. Because then we have the opportunity to start colonoscopy early and pluck it out while it's small to avoid having to have a surgery. While you can't change your family history, here are some things that you can affect. A special consideration is the use of hormone therapy in women after menopause. There have been studies that have shown a wide range of effects. Those that show there's a severe risk of using this therapy, others that suggest that there's a protective benefit. Confused? Of course you are, and this is because dramatic results get more airtime, whereas the studies that have a mixed results or no change at all, they don't really get much attention. Luckily, researchers have compiled results from all the studies and come to the conclusion that there's unlikely any real connection between the use of hormone therapy after menopause and an increased risk for colon cancer. Similarly, there's been an exciting suggestion that the use of insects such as aspirin could be protective against colon cancer. Yet other studies have refuted that. And on balance, when researchers have analyzed all the studies currently available, there's presently no strong connection between the use of NSAIDs and prevention of colon cancer. What about things that your doctor tells you definitely not to do, like smoking? We count smoking exposure in terms of pack years. So if you smoked a half pack a day to get through the 90s, that'd be a five pack year exposure and estimates are that would increase your risk of colon cancer by 6%. But if you've been smoking a pack a day for the past 30 years since, then your risk is substantially higher, 26%. Now, notably, the risk of dying from colon cancer is also higher if you've been a smoker. And that's probably because your overall health is not as good and you're less able to fend off the disease and to tolerate its treatments. There's been a lot of hype to suggest that wine has health benefits. Spoiler, it probably doesn't have any unique benefit. Moderate drinking has been found to increase the risk of colon cancer, and that's defined as even two or three drinks a day. While moderate drinking raised the risk of colon cancer by 21%, heavy drinking, defined as four more drinks a day, increased the risk by 50%. Light drinking is at most only a little risk based on pooling studies and analyzing their collective results. Obesity is a lifestyle epidemic, especially in the United States and the risk of developing colon cancer increases by 10% in a person whose BMI is 30, which meets the threshold of obesity, versus a person whose BMI is 22, which is comfortably in the middle of the usual healthy range. Yet when data analyzes the effects of obesity only on men, it seemed to be substantially higher, 30% increased risk, which is likely because the male fat distribution is very different than women. Men tend to hold their fat in the center of their body, hanging off of their abdominal organs, and that means its ill effects of inflammation is going to more directly impact the colon. Red meat has been linked to colon cancer, and some studies have suggested such a strong effect that you would wish you'd never eaten beef. But a collective analysis showed that people who had five or more servings of beef a week had a 13% increased risk of getting colon cancer compared to people who did not. If you eat less meat, you have a lower risk. And this isn't that big of a risk even with having a lot of red meat. Processed meat was a more profound risk. A lower dose of only 50 grams, which is about an ounce, actually increased your risk by 16%. Overall though, it's thought that red meat, processed meat, eat in moderation is kind of like drinking. As long as you're doing it light, there's probably no profound harm. Finally, there's the hope that you can protect yourself by having an active lifestyle and eating healthy. Analysis of various studies researching the benefits of fruits and vegetables have found that each can reduce your risk for getting colon cancer by 15%. How much did you need to eat? Three servings of fruit, 
and five servings of vegetables. An active lifestyle reduced the risk of getting colon cancer by 12%. Here you would need to be walking briskly 20 minutes, three times a week. The ultimate goal of this research is to build a risk calculator. It's unlikely to be as simple as tallying up the numbers that I've just described, but a risk calculator would be great for knowing who can defer a colonoscopy or go longer between colonoscopy and who most urgently needs to have one. When I think of the future of colon cancer screening, I hope that we can more tailor your individual risk to your need for having a colonoscopy so we can make the best use of this resource. But until then, subscribe to the channel and keep learning about your GI health. Thank you and be safe.